So now um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you Dr. Kevin Strang. Um, Dr. Strang uh, has been at UW Madison for uh, quite a bit of time. He and I have collaborated uh, several times in having conversations uh, with uh, members of the community and with students at, uh, in my class and other classes on the topic of the world's second most popular drug. So uh, Kevin, if you're ready, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Shakshiri. So caffeine is number one, and when I speak to those audiences, they often, when I say, what's the most popular, they say cocaine, marijuana, you know, illegal drug after illegal drug. Um, they don't stop and think about a perfectly ordinary, everyday substance like caffeine, which people take for a reason. It alters their body function. It has side effects. That's what a drug is. Anything we take with the intent of altering body function, but that also has side effects because of the redundant plan that the human body is built on, it's a drug. And so uh, I unapologetically tell college students, yes, you are ingesting a drug uh, when you're drinking alcohol. So my, this is my general scheme for the evening. I've got three sort of overall things I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about why we drink, um, how does it work at a chemical, physiological level. I'm going to then talk about some of the neurological effects that people are after. Why do people medicate themselves with alcohol? What are they looking for? We'll talk about that for a while for the main body of the talk. And at the very end, I'm going to uh, maybe be slightly controversial, may maybe intrigue you and suggest some really great reading um, having to do with a particular reason we drink, and that has to do with the cultural, historical, um, the, the history of alcohol in human civilization. So uh, that'll be at the very end. So that's my general plan. So why do people drink? And I've polled many college audiences, and I ask, um, you know, why do you reach? And I make them really think, why do you reach for a drink? And it comes down to the first five on this list, basically, are reasons people self-medicate with alcohol. Uh, to get a mood boost, it is a euphorogen. We'll talk about that. It increases social confidence. Um, people have this misconception that it is an anxiolytic drug. It is a relaxant. It is not, and I'll show you a study that proves it is not. Um, many people you've heard of taking a nightcap to help you sleep, the very common thing in our culture. Um, it turns out it's a terrible sleep aid, and I'll tell you why. And then escape from problems. So um, people drink to forget things that they want to forget, and that may work to an extent, but very often, as I'll talk about, they forget things that they're not intending to forget. And then the, the last thing, it's not really, uh, people aren't self-medicating because of their culture or history, maybe, unless they've got one of those families. I have one of those families. Um, but uh, I think it is an underlying reason why, I mean, here we are in the great state of Wisconsin. Alcohol is a very important topic. One of the most important public health topics on a college campus in a state uh, that I think there is, which is why I'm so passionate about talking about this topic um, to all the audiences that I talk to. Okay, so at a, at a fundamental level, I bet most people who drink don't really know exactly how this drug works. It's unique in the drug world. When a pharmacologist designs a drug aimed at a brain protein or aimed at your kidney or your liver, there are often massive molecules that are shaped very specifically to attach to certain targets chemically. Um, as we'll see, alcohol, it's, it's a skeleton key. It's a universal key. So quickly, all about you. You're made of about 75 trillion cells, and those cells make up the different organ systems of your body. And each one of those cells um, has some features in common and some different from cells that are in other organs. So you've got cells in your eyeball that when a photon of light strikes it, a neural signal goes to your brain and tells you you're seeing something. You've got cells that are in your muscles, for example, they can, uh, much like ethanol in a combustion engine, they can turn chemical energy in the food you eat into physical force, into movement. These are all the things that cells are specialized to do. But there is a similarity among all those cells. It comes down to they are basically um, a bag of lipid, a lipid that has a consistency very similar to Crisco oil, but at a molecular scale, that's a fairly stiff cell membrane or cell wall. And so you see the, the double blue band, that's a, a phospholipid bilayer <laughs> membrane. And, and then you've got proteins. Proteins are the machines that distinguish one body cell's ability to do one function from another body cell's ability to do another function. So those photons of light are striking specific proteins in your eyes, and you don't have those proteins in your muscles, which is why you can't see with your muscles. So those protein machines take on all kinds of forms. their are ion channels, their are enzymes, their are receptors, their are signals. Anything your body can do, it does because of this generic membrane hosting the cell, and then proteins that are in the membrane, proteins that are inside and out that, uh, that act throughout your body. Well, it turns out, the chemistry of ethanol interacts very nicely with proteins. So the cartoon at the upper right there, 
If you don't know, a protein is a long string of amino acids. And by the way, this fabulous, elegant molecule here, DNA, that's where your genetic heritage lies. And what, it's, what it really does is when you go to make a muscle cell or a brain cell or a liver cell, um, the DNA that's in all of your cells is exactly the same. But what happens is different parts of it get expressed, get translated into a protein that gets put into that cell for its function. So remember that all proteins are made from DNA. All the same DNA is in all of your cells. Um, but only certain ones are expressed. So that cartoon of a protein, the green blob sticking out to the side, amino acids have side chains, side chains with chemical natures. And you heard a little bit about polar and nonpolar bonds here. So the blue ones are to uh, identify polar side groups that are very friendly with water. They're, they dissolve well in water. They have electrical charges, some of them. And the green blobs represent amino acids that have something like a hydrocarbon side chain, something like these, uh, like carbon-carbon with hydrogen chains with no oxygens involved. So that's a very oily type of molecular structure. The blue ones represent hydrophilic, a water-loving chemical structure. And depending on the sequence of amino acids, you take that long string, if I dunk it into water, what's going to happen to it? It's going to fold. It's going to fold into a shape. You know if you put oil and water in a jar and you shake it, they separate, right? That fundamental force is, is one of the huge forces that drives the, the, the design of the human body. Hydrophobic interactions or the, the fear of, of nonpolar substances for, for water. So in a watery climate, that's what that protein would do. It would fold so that all those blue blobs, the amino acid side chains, are facing the watery bloodstream, if that's where we are. And the, uh, the uh, hydrophobic ones, the, the polar side chains, are going to be like the, the oil gathering itself together inside of the jar. I mean, it turns out ethanol, so you've seen the structure. There's a simple representation of ethanol. It's an amphipathic molecule. It has both the nonpolar end, the carbon chains with the hydrogen, so that's a very lipid-friendly, fatty-friendly substance. And then it's got the, the OH group at the other end. Um, and and I, I'm glad uh, we also got the introduction. When I say alcohol, I'm always talking about ethanol. There are many, there are many alcohols, obviously. But if you take that little, tiny, generic molecule and introduce it to a big protein that is folded in a certain way because of, because of nonpolar and polar um, um, side chains interacting with each other, It'll wedge into a crack, and it might twist it open and make it function less well. It might twist it in another way and increase its function. It's, it's highly random. It's like a skeleton key that can open any door. And you have proteins in every cell of your body. And so ethanol is this universal key that can affect proteins throughout your body. And so we're going to talk about the brain today, but I think it, you're well aware in the popular culture, somebody who drinks too much, the cardiovascular system suffers, um, high blood pressure happens, heart failure happens. Um, any um, emergency room doctor will tell you that uh, in December every year there's a rash of people my age and slightly older uh, coming into emergency rooms with heart arrhythmias, with even heart attacks, because they overindulge in alcohol that time of year, and then one of the side effects of doses of alcohol are the uh, arrhythmias of the heart. Um, gastrointestinal system, I'm sure you know that long Heavy use of alcohol will cause cirrhosis of the rib liver. It'll destroy the liver. Um, alcohol in high doses contributes to gastric ulcers. And uh, urinary system, you might or might not be aware that if you drink 12 ounces of an alcoholic beverage because you're thirsty, which means your body is crying for more liquid volume, what will happen is that 12 ounces will come out in your urine, as will about four ounces of your own body fluid. So that's why people wake up in the morning after a night of drinking very dehydrated. Even though they've taken in all that liquid the night before, they're very dehydrated because alcohol blocks the kidney's ability to concentrate your urine. Reproductive and endocrine disorders, so uh, very often women who are of an age where they're trying to conceive um, might have difficulty if they're regular alcohol users because alcohol will alter the shape of proteins that are hormones that cause the female menstrual cycle to regulate normally. And so you can have menstrual cycle irregularities that prevent fertility. Um, I try not to say that to my college-age crowd because I don't want them using alcohol as a form of birth control. <laughs> not suggested. The reason people self-medicate, though, at the lower right is the nervous system. And so I'm going to talk in more depth um, at a cellular molecular level, how does alcohol affect the nervous system. So on the left, you see a pink neuron, a nerve cell. And uh, they're actually much longer and more dramatic than that. That's a cartoon. But um, the key feature here is that that pink neuron, you see a few, few dozen neurons coming to it and making contacts with it. And then it's branching four times, and it's contacting four other neurons. Well, in your brain and spinal cord, a neuron might branch thousands to tens of thousands of times. And so in your brain, you have maybe 100 billion neurons. But that isn't what makes you talented or intelligent 
or that's not why you have all the wonderful memories that you have. Your brain really functions on the synapses. Where those neurons touch each other, there's a small gap. At the right, you see a bigger cartoon of the gap called a synapse. And that synapse is a place where a chemical signal is sent from one nerve cell to the next, either telling it, hey, you should fire a signal, or telling it, don't fire a signal. And when you branch 100 billion neurons and interconnect them, and any neuron in that uh, set, in that network, every second of every day of your life, there are thousands of neurons telling that neuron, you should fire, you shouldn't fire, and it has to make a decision. It's basically a, a processor that, based on the total number of inputs, if more say fire, it fires, and then its message gets passed along the chain. In those connections, in those chains, is where all your memories are. If you learn something new about chemistry tonight, the reason you'll remember it tomorrow is that your brain is physically different. The synapses between neurons are stronger. There are more of them. They're different. Uh, so very profound, the interconnection between neurons, that everything you learn, everything you are, everything you can do is in those synapses. Well, if you look at the synapse close, you see a bunch of little oval circles. That's cartoons of proteins, <coughs> proteins that are ion channels, proteins involved in releasing that chemical called a neurotransmitter when a signal comes down. So those proteins are abundant, and it turns out they're very sensitive to alcohol's effects to alter their shape. In some people, they're up-regulated. Sometimes they're down-regulated. Uh, within a person and between people, it varies a little bit. I should have mentioned when we talked about proteins. Um, me and just about anyone in the room, if you compared a protein in the same cell type, in the same part of our body that does the same thing, we don't have exactly the same protein sequence. In fact, if you have an identical twin, and if you looked at all your proteins, they're not exactly the same. Life experience changes the sequence of our proteins. It changes the expression of our DNA. Um, and that's important because we're going to talk about the wildly variable way that alcohol affects people. And that's part of the basis because this generic uh, skeleton key of alcohol doesn't affect uh, all proteins exactly the same. So this is a short list of neurotransmitters, the chemical signal between neurons, um, that have been shown to be profoundly affected by alcohol. And at different doses, they have differential sensitivities, and different people with slightly different sequences of proteins, they're going to have different effects. And so alcohol is a terrible medication because, I mean, what, what makes a good medication is when you take it, when anyone on earth takes it, you want it to have a consistent effect. Um, one like that is uh, Valium. So Valium is a drug that you give to anyone on earth, everyone has the same reaction. It's a very specific, it, it's an anxiolytic, it calms people down, it slows your brain down. Um, alcohol can do that. But it can also do a lot of other things. Um, and it has to do with, it affects so many different things. It's sometimes been called a pharmacological hand grenade. Cocaine is a pharmacological scalpel. It really affects one thing. Alcohol affects a lot of things. And uh, so the outcome can be very unpredictable. So one outcome, why do people medicate themselves with alcohol? Well, very often they, it's used, I mean, various words are used, to get a buzz, to get high. The word I'll use is euphoria. Uh, you know, you, you poll a college audience and you'll hear probably 50 different words. This is real. This happens to most people who drink alcohol. So you have these pleasure centers in your brain that are there for a good reason. When you do something that increases the likelihood of your survival or your species survival, there's a pleasure center in your brain that lights up. You get this great feeling that reinforces it, says, do that again. So if you eat a big bowl of fatty ice cream, this center lights up. Do that again. You know, you'll survive the next famine. Uh, someone tells you they love you and they really mean it, and you know they mean it. This pleasure center lights up. Interactions between people are really reinforced by this pleasure center, and specifically dopamine. The neurotransmitter chemical dopamine is a very important one. It turns out the way alcohol influences the dopamine pathway explains why binge drinking happens, and it also can explain why some people become dependent on alcohol for enjoyment. And so I'm going to explain this with a graph that I've kind of invented, a very simple graph. But uh, follow my logic, if you will. So what we've got here is time flowing along the uh, bottom axis. Your blood alcohol is on the uh, uh, vertical axis. And so if you have one drink, this is what it would look like. Your blood alcohol would rise while you were drinking it. When you stop drinking, your liver and stomach have enzymes we'll talk about later that can remove alcohol. About one drink an hour in an average person gets removed. So as soon as you stop drinking, the blood alcohol declines. Well, if you just felt OK and you didn't have that drink for any particular reason, most people on Earth will experience um, a rush, a euphoria, a sudden mood that is better than their mood was before they started drinking. Dopamine, it turns out, is, is a double-edged sword. Dopamine is a great thing. It lights up your pleasure center. It makes you feel good. But there are many uh, disease conditions, like schizophrenia, 
excess of dopamine is one of the underlying factors in people who have the mental disorder of schizophrenia. So anything in the body in excess, the body has a, what I call, what physiologists call a negative feedback response. They say, hey, that's too much of that. And so there are mechanisms that will compensate, that will counter it. Turns out dopamine, this happens very fast. So you might think you would slide from a happy place back down to your okay place, but what happens is as soon as your blood alcohol starts down, the dopamine receptors have been desensitized, they've been hidden. What happens is your mood dips to below baseline level. People whose blood alcohol is falling, even while it's still elevated, they're not happy anymore. Um, I call this the rising phase effect, because in the rising phase we feel good, and then when we're in the falling phase, blood alcohol is still elevated, but we, uh, we aren't as sensitive to it. And so, and this, if you've ever, I mean, if you've ever observed the uh, student body at a UW football game and, you know, thinking that they're like camels, they can drink a bunch of water before they cross the desert, many of them will drink a lot of beer before going into the game, so it will last the whole game long. And what often, those who have overindulged, what you'll see is they're going crazy in the first half of the game, that's the rising phase, and then third and fourth quarter, regardless of what's happening in the game, you start to see them sinking lower and you start to see the body posture of someone who's not having fun anymore. Um, and if you've ever been in a setting where you've drank and then stopped drink, drinking and stayed awake, you might have experienced that. This is why binge drinking is gonna happen. It's inevitable, especially in young people. So binge drinking looks like this. You go to a, a situation, social situation, where there's alcohol, and your blood alcohol rises after your first drink, and you say, that's it, I'm done, I just wanted one. Well, as soon as it starts down, if you've got several hours of social yet to go, and your blood alcohol's on the way down, the social situation isn't fun. Your pleasure center is, is turned down. And so people will reach for another one. As long as the rising phase is maintained, the, the euphoria, the mood boost is maintained. And so in our culture, people tend to start drinking in the evening and they drink as many as it takes to get them to the end. And I say people, I'm talking about the young people that I normally speak to. <laughs> Apologies to those of you who uh, uh, don't necessarily fit the profile of, of my typical talk, but binge drinking does occur and that's why it occurs. And they do it in the evening and then they stop drinking and go home and what do they do? They lie in bed for eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours. And they are not aware, but they're feeling horrible. Their mood is terrible, but they're unconscious, and so they're not aware of it. People don't drink from 8 to noon and then go about their day because you would have the worst day of your life. Uh, pharmacologically, if that's when we drank in the morning, you would not feel good all day long, and I think it would be a negative reinforcement of drinking. So we drink in the evening so that we're unconscious. I'm not an anti-alcohol crusader. My version of what responsible drinking is is the following. Uh, it's... Be aware that high doses of alcohol has side effects, negative side effects you don't want. So aim for a number of drinks that's okay to have and find a way to slow the rate of the rising phase so that you get that buzz, that euphoria without ever reaching the range where vomiting occurs and crashing of cars occurs and that kind of thing. And then there's a short time frame where you don't feel well. The rate of removal is the same. In my book, that's responsible drinking. And having food in your stomach slows the rate of rise by threefold versus drinking on an empty stomach. Also, uh, the type of liquor makes a big difference. So somebody who does a shot, a one and a half ounce shot of whiskey, it starts up just like the red pattern there and it starts going down very quickly to people who bring, drink low alcohol, beer, wine, that kind of thing. Um, you know, alcoholism as we know it didn't exist until the 1600s when distillation um, was discovered. So basically the ability to make the percent alcohol in the beverage go up into the 40 and 50 and 60 percent range. That's when alcoholism really became a problem. Did I see a question back there? Particularly at this point, dopamine. Yep. But are you prepared at all to tell us about binge drinking's effects on somebody's judgment? Oh, absolutely. Could you repeat the question slightly? Yeah, so the question was, um, am I going to talk about the effects of binge drinking, especially on judgment? And that's exactly the point I'm about to make. I'm, I'm, you're, you led me to the point that I really need to make with my young audiences when I talk about this. So thank you. Yes, that's where we're going. So dopamine tolerance, think of it in two different time frames. In one bout of drinking, you desensitize, and so you want more. It explains why people drink too much in a bout. Over time, the dopamine system can become desensitized to the point where somebody chronically, uh, to feel normal, to feel happy, and this is the definition of, of an alcoholic or an alcohol-dependent person, they need something boosting their dopamine to feel normal, to feel happy, and that uh, has to do with the dopamine system and related systems. So young people are going to binge drink if you give them access to alcohol. It's not their fault. It will happen because 
the left frontal lobe of the brain, which is where our impulse control center is, it doesn't mature until someone's in their 20s. If you put an M&M &M in front of a three-year-old and you say, all right, I'm going to leave the room, and if you leave that there when I come back, I'll give you three M&Ms, they'll eat it anyway the minute you're out of the room. As we get older, we, have, we're, we can delay gratification better and better. And in our 20s is really when that left frontal lobe is developed. And so younger drinkers are going to be more susceptible to the inability to say no to a second drink than someone who's in their 20s. We can control those impulses better. Uh, and of the people who binge drink early, by age 14, the, the data suggests, they have a 50-50 shot of at some point being identified as someone who's alcohol dependent. Um, people who don't drink until their 20s, until early 20s, um, only an 8% chance. Still a chance, but, but the odds go way, way down. So early exposure to alcohol desensitizes the dopamine system in some people permanently, and it makes them susceptible to alcoholism. CDC uh, statistics, 17% of US adults binge drink. And if you take it to the college age, the, the group that I talk to most often, 50% binge drink regularly. And it's nine drinks at a sitting. I mean, I can't walk after three drinks. Not that I've ever tried that. Well, me, I've tried that. Nine drinks. It's amazing the tolerance. The tolerance of youth, and there is a physiological difference between young and old people. I don't know if you've noticed, if you're scanning the newspaper and you see drunk driving arrest reports, very frequently you'll see people in their 40s and 50s being arrested for drunk driving. Um, and if it's a first offense, very often that person has been drunk driving for years and years, but we become, our motor tolerance goes down as we get older. An 18-year-old who is drunk is a better driver than a 50-year-old who is drunk. Neither are good drivers, but if I had to compare them, the 18-year-old is a better driver. Question. As you know, the Lewis and Clark expedition was, a, was not only, as you know, the Lewis and Clark expedition proceeded, was, was fueled by copious amounts of alcohol. It was the most uh, important thing they had on their journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, why has it become, why have they got the more Calvinistic attitude towards alcohol in our society now? That's an excellent question. And if you can just hold off gratification, your left frontal lobe, if you can just dampen it, that's exactly what the, the finish line of this talk is about. There's a great book I'm going to refer you to. I mean, every military campaign in history has been fueled by alcohol. It is such a part of our culture, the politics, war, religion. Um, you can't extricate alcohol from our culture, and you're not wrong about Lewis and Clark. Um, and there's a trade-off that I'll talk about at the end having to do with do you want to die in your 20s of cholera, or do you want to die of your 40s of cirrhosis of the liver? And that's often been the choice that's had to be made throughout history. So, oh, but lots of great achievements. I agree with that completely. Some of the greatest artists and writers of our time alcohol fueled. And this book I'm going to refer you to tells the story eloquently and beautifully. So great question. Um, people drink, especially young people, to overcome inhibitions. And this same left frontal lobe of your brain that I talked about being your impulse control center, it also makes you shy. It keeps you from, say, some of you in, a, in an audience like this might have a very insightful question, but you're just a little bit too inhibited to raise your hand and ask it. Um, that's, that's normal, acceptable, and important social behavior. It stops us from doing inappropriate things socially. Alcohol, that's one of the first centers it hits, and it increases our social confidence. To think normally, you need a normal balance of two neurotransmitters in particular. 90% of the neurotransmitters in your brain are either glutamate or GABA. Glutamate is the main gas pedal. It's the main excitatory neurotransmitter system, and GABA is the main inhibitory one. Valium, by the way, stimulates the GABA system. The, GAB, the GABA system slows your brain down. It calms your brain. The glutamate system excites your brain. And for you to be normal and make normal good decisions, you need to have a good balance. So things happen to you, and you have thoughts. And you do something. You have some behavior, some external behavior in response to thoughts and to experiences that you have. And a lot goes into this amazing 100 billion neuron processor you have is capable of accessing a lot of things in milliseconds before it makes a decision. I mean, you have a basic personality. Is the glass half full to you or half empty? Um, you have an empathy, compassion. They found neurons in the brain now, by the way, that, that are the empathy neurons, that stimulating that neuron makes you understand how another person feels. But we all have an empathy and compassion, with the exception of a few sociopaths, probably. Um, we have a sense of what's just, what's fair. We all have an understanding of cause and effect. If I touch an electrode to a bottle full of uh, ethanol, what's going to happen? Um, and then much more complicated situations in the real world. If I, 
if I use this racial slur to this person standing in front of me, what's likely to happen? Uh, biological drives. We have parts of our brains that are programmed in sexual ways, in appetitive ways. Um, we have this hedonistic appetite for salt. That's a biological drive. And uh, that goes into decisions that we make. Situational memories. You've not only experienced life, but you've seen other people experience lives and cause and effect. And you can access memories like that before you make a decision about what to say, what to do, how to act. And then cultural learning. Things that are acceptable in one culture are not in another, and it takes a lifetime sometimes to learn exactly what's appropriate in a context, in a cultural context. So somebody says something to me, all of these different centers of my brain, I can access them, I can come up with a net judgment, and this is all synapses talking to each other, and then a behavior, an outcome results. Question? The glute GABA circuits are feedback loops then? So it, the glutamate and GABA circuits are related in negative feedback. So if you get too much glutamate activity, and someone who has, who's like that might have anxiety and shaky hands, might not be able to sleep. And so there are negative feedback built in on both of those. So glutamate, too much glutamate will tell the glutamate neurons to stop releasing so much. And also when the glutamate neurons release too much, GABA neurons will ramp up and they'll tell the glutamate neurons calm down. That's how you stay balanced and feel, um, feel normal. So it's well known pharmacologically that alcohol is bad for glutamate synapses, it inhibits them, and it's good for GABA synapses like Valium is. Um, and so someone who has alcohol in their system, as the dose goes up, effectively, if their brain was a computer, the processing speed gets slower and slower and slower as the dose rises. And so think of a computer with a slow processor. You can only have one window open at a time or a few windows open at a time. And effectively, the human brain becomes like that. There's a very eloquent model by a scientist named Claude Bernard who, who used this really simple basic thing that alcohol does, slow the processor, to explain a lot of the, the uh, unpredictability in the behavioral effects, effects of alcohol. And the model's called myopia. And if you don't know, myopia means nearsighted. And so alcohol myopia means basically on high doses of alcohol, a person becomes cognitively nearsighted. All they can think about is what's right in front of them at that moment. They can't, you know, a myopic person can see right here, but they can't see in the distance. And so as your brain becomes simplified by high doses of alcohol, something may happen to you and you may only access one or another but not all of the complex decision-making circuits you have in your brain. So it's been shown very convincingly that people can be more empathetic and compassionate when they're drunk. I mean, if you've ever, ever been to a fundraiser, one of the first things they do is they hand you a glass of champagne. People tip more, people donate more when there's alcohol in their system. Uh, it's also very clear that, that uh, sexual assault, alcohol is a major factor on college campuses and elsewhere in sexual assault, basic human drives. Any kind of domestic violence, very often, alcohol and basic biological drives override thoughts of cause and effect, consequences, uh, situational memories. And so very simple model to explain why does alcohol have such disparate effects. So here's a study that I'm going to use to demonstrate that and also to debunk a myth. Alcohol is not an anti-anxiety drug. This study proves it. So this is how the study goes. Volunteers invited to a party, and they're told free alcohol. And this is college-age crowd, so it's very easy to get volunteers for a study like this. Half are given drinks. The other half have drinks, but, and they smell like there's alcohol, but there's not really alcohol. Everybody has to think they're drinking to have a perfect control, scientific control. So they all drink for half an hour. And then the researchers say, oh, we forgot to tell you. In about 15 minutes, you have to go on stage and give an impromptu speech. What I most dislike about my body and physical appearance. So snakes, spiders, and public speaking are the things people fear the most. And so this was a stimulus designed to make these people anxious. And so then they're going to have to sit for 15 minutes, and their speech is going to happen. They're going to have a crowd of strangers looking at their body as they discuss their body. I mean, what could be more anxiety-inducing than that? But then to make this experiment more complicated, so they've got these two groups, the, the drinkers and the think they're drinkers. Um, they divide them into four groups, and one group just sits and does nothing. They're just waiting for their speech. And then there's three groups that are kept busier and busier sorting slides, an intellectual task that takes more and more mental effort. And then they measure anxiety, and they use the physiological and psychotropic measures to see how anxious they got um, over the next 15 minutes. And the data are very simple. This is what they look like. Uh, on the left, you see the people who thought they were drinking but were not, the placebo group. Any bar that goes up from the midline, they got more stressed. And any bar that goes down, they got less stressed. And you'll see 
they didn't experience a lot of stress, increase in stress during the 15 minutes. I mean, the ones in the black bar that were um, really kept busy sorting slides, they actually became less nervous because they didn't have time to think or worry about this speech, this impending speech. Look at the group on the right. The only group that became more anxious are the ones that had alcohol in their system and had nothing to do. Alcohol doesn't make you relaxed. Alcohol exaggerates whatever mood you're in, whatever's happening to you. You're myopically responding to whatever is in your world. If there's a death in your family and you get drunk, that will become the only thing you can think about. If you're out at a party with your friends and somebody says something funny, you'll laugh uproariously because that's the only thing you think about. You become myopic. Uh, and in this case, anxiety was the situation, and anxiety is enhanced, is, is intensified by alcohol. It doesn't relax you unless you're in a relaxing situation, then it does. And it boosts self-confidence. So I told you young people drink for self-esteem reasons. So here's, here's where I'm a little bit irreverent. I apologize. But the onion is funny because it's so often true. Um, and uh, alcohol, beverage, consumer confidence does skyrocket as the evening goes on very often because of myopia. When someone who's drinking can only think about what a great dancer they are or how good looking they are, and they don't stop and think about all the times that there's been someone much good looking or a better dancer next to them, their confidence skyrockets. And uh, often they have brilliant epiphanies like this young man, you know, coming up with this uh, uh, brilliant tactic for, for being attractive to women um, and, and not to sort of... Uh, bias things from a gender standpoint. I mean, ladies come ahead. They have their own version of bad things arising from excessive social confidence. Here's to the question that I was asked earlier. Not only does confidence go up, but because of the simplification of the processor and all of the things that you're not able to access at high doses of alcohol, bad ideas galore begin to spawn. So let me just flash a few bad ideas that you might spawn at high doses of alcohol. That's a bad idea if you uh, know anything about electricity at all. Uh, this is a bad idea if you're a, a doctor who works in the burn unit, for example. Um, Halloween parties should never end this way. <laughs> According to the CDC, 38% of emergency room visits, alcohol is involved. Now stop and think how many emergency room visits there must be across this country. 38%. Bad judgment and also motor coordination. Car accidents are a large part of that number. But uh, bad ideas, often leading to injury, are uh, because of the poor judgment, because of people whose normally brilliant minds are not functioning uh, with, with all of their RAM intact. So another important uh, thing is that in adults, those proteins fold and then they unfold, and you don't have necessarily irreversible cognitive effects until you get really, really high doses. So binge drinkers by the age of 14 have smaller brains, um, and they're not as smart as people who didn't binge drink when they were young. So one interpretation of those data might be, um, oh, then maybe, maybe it's just the kids with small brains who are dumb to begin with are the ones that are binge drinking so early. Um, animal studies have very convincingly shown that if you take identical groups of animals, and one group drinks as adolescents and the other group doesn't drink until later, you see exactly the same thing. This, a big part of this is cause and effect. It shrinks. So I, I like to use this analogy for, to explain that. Think of your proteins, your body proteins, as construction workers. So if a construction worker basically is, uh, um, drinks in the evening, drinks on the weekend, when they're not actually building, the building they're working on is going to be fine. They're building when they're sober. But if they're drunk while they are building, a young person's nervous system is being built. Those proteins are part of the building. The synapses are part of the building. Um, twisting those proteins during the construction is going to make for um, poor construction of the nervous system. And uh, in the extreme, you get fetal alcohol syndrome, but you get more subtle, measurable effects, even in kids who uh, just start binge drinking when they're 14. OK, another self-medication mode to, uh, to forget, to escape from problems. And sleep and forgetting is going to be part of the theme that runs here. So when people drink, if they're in a boring situation, dark, quiet room, a nightcap will make you sleepy. It changes the brain chemistry in the direction that sleep becomes more likely. But alcohol-induced sleep is not true sleep. Um, it looks very relaxing. People, somebody might seem difficult to rouse like they're in a deep, deep sleep. What it is, it's sur surgical anesthesia. Natural sleep, in natural neurological sleep, people's brains have time frames when they are much more active than even the waking brain. There are very important functions that happen, especially in a 
mode of sleep called rapid eye movement sleep. It's when you're dreaming. The brain has a very important job to do, and it has to do with going through the whole day's worth of data you just lived, all the thoughts you had, everything you saw and heard, and it decides which of these things need to be encoded in a synapse that I want with me tomorrow, and which was just superfluous detail that, that uh, I might go crazy if I remembered. So that's happening when a person sleeps. When someone is in an alcohol-induced slumber, or any level of alcohol, is going to reduce the ability of the brain to do that. So very, very simplistically, short-term memory, what you're thinking about now, becomes a memory through a process called LTP, long-term potentiation. And that happens in REM sleep. Alcohol doesn't let you do REM sleep. You may be unconscious for eight or nine hours, but you're not refreshed. REM sleep is what you need to feel refreshed, and people often feel very tired after a night in bed, after a night of drinking, because they didn't actually get REM sleep. The next night, they'll have to get catch-up sleep. So this memory formation process does not happen as well or normally when someone lays down with alcohol in their system. So you can't drink to forget past memories. You can drink to forget what you did last night, and people who drink to the point where they have blackouts walk around, young people especially, often walk around and function and do things and have conversations, and pictures of them show up on Facebook, and they have no memory. There was no recording. Uh, while alcohol is in your system, you can't form memory. But escaping past problems doesn't work, and people often become depressed because that alcohol myopia might focus their mind only on the depressing thing in their life. They can't escape from it. It becomes, it consumes them. It becomes the only thing in their world. So relevant to uh, my college student crowd, um, drinking goes on at colleges in great quantities. 50% of college students binge drink. Many college students fail out their freshman year. This is a big reason they don't understand the relationship between uh, learning, sleep, and alcohol. So they'll study for six hours on a Thursday night. They have a test on Friday. And they'll say, yeah, that's it. I've studied it all. I'm done. I'm ready. And then rather than go to sleep, they go out with their friends. So they drink for three hours. They lay in bed for eight hours or 10 hours. They take the test, and they find they have very little memory of what they studied during that six-hour time frame. They don't understand that you need the sleep to concretize the memory. I tell my students, if you study for six hours, sleep that night. If you drink the next night, memories of the past are secure. You're not going to ruin your college career. If you can separate learning and sleeping from drinking, um, you can you know, live the college experience to some extent. I urge uh, uh, moderation, don't get me wrong, but uh, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not unrealistic enough to believe that I could ever get a college crowd to stop drinking because of anything I say, no matter how scary. But if they can learn about the physiology of memory and alcohol and sleep, uh, maybe I can save some college careers by spreading this message. OK, and now to the question that we want to, uh, want to get to. So sort of the little final phase I want to talk about. So people drink because they're self-medicating for the reasons that we just talked about and with the mechanisms that we just talked about. Here we are in Wisconsin. We have a rich cultural history. We have a uh, history of alcohol, drinking and alcohol. I, I mean, um, drinking in our culture in Wisconsin. I'm going to quickly go through some animal studies that prove alcohol preference and alcohol behavior effects. Are, they're highly genetic. They're highly producible. So for example, fruit fly studies many years ago, 40 years ago, fruit flies, you give them a little alcohol vapor, and they do what humans do after they've been drinking. Um, they tend to fall down. And it turns out if you take a bunch of flies and you expose them to a vapor, and the first few who fall, you sweep them aside, and then later on, you introduce those, and you introduce those, and they have offspring, their offspring will be even more likely to fall down quickly. The fly line is called cheap date, sort of humorously by the scientists who developed it, because a low, low dose of alcohol, these flies become effectively inebriated, whatever passes for inebriated in a fly. So you can breed into them lightweightness, if that is a characteristic. <coughs> there is a lab. It started in Stanford. Now it's in Boulder, Colorado. In the 1960s, they took a bunch of mice. And they, um, animals don't like to drink, so often they vaporize the alcohol. Sometimes they inject it. But they get a bunch of mice drunk. And they see how they behave. And then they'll say, well, these two both, when they get drunk, they sleep a long time. Let's breed them. And then breed their kids. And then breed their kids. And you can selectively breed mice to have the entire range of behaviors that you might see in yourself or in your friends or in your families or in your culture. So some mice fall asleep after a little bit of drinking and they sleep for hours. Some mice fall immediately to sleep and they wake up with their heart pounding and sweaty if you can inter you know, interpret the mice behavior 
Um, and many people do this after heavy drinking. They'll only sleep a few hours, and they have this rebound effect. They're wide awake. Um, some of these mice act like they're at a, a party, at a rave. They go crazy. They run around the cage when they're drunk. Um, they don't fall asleep at all. Some of them, the body temperature falls. Some of them, the body temperature skyrockets. Some are very uh, degenerative tremor prone. When they sober up, they, they shake violently, which happens to many uh, human alcoholics after a long binge when you deprive them of alcohol. And then there's also a super strain of college age mice that no matter how much alcohol you give them, they pass all the coordination tests. You know, they, they'll have these rotating wooden bars, and they'll have the mice walk across. And how far they get says how coordinated they are. And so a sober mouse will make it all, all the way across. One that's a little drunker will fall off earlier, and one that's drunker will fall off earlier. Well, these, this resistant strain of mice, they bred into their DNA, into their protein structure, the ability to handle enormous amounts of alcohol. And they walk right across that bar, and they don't fall down. Um, and you see that maybe in people you know. There are some people you know who drink a little bit, and they're silly, and they're tipsy, and they fall down, and they slur their words. And others you might know who, after their ninth drink, might be hard to tell that they've been drinking. Um, and I'm about to go into the cultural history why that might be. Um, but more, more crossbreeding uh, experiments have been done. And these, these last two are kind of interesting. Animals don't like to drink alcohol usually. But if you can find a couple of animals that don't mind it and crossbreed them, and then take their offspring and find ones that don't mind it or even like it and crossbreed them, you can breed in a love for drinking alcohol over water or fruit juice or anything else. So the love of the feeling of drinking alcohol is also genetic and can be bred into a population of monkeys. Um, another thing that uh, can create alcohol preference, and this one is a little bit sad to me. Um, it was an important experiment that was done, and it's one you can't do in humans. but. It is the natural experiment, sadly, is done. Uh, this, this group at NIH took a bunch of baby monkeys, and they took them away from their mothers. And they gave them all to foster mothers, half of which were known to be very good mothers. They cuddled the babies. They groomed them. They fed them well. Um, and then half were known to be not very good mothers. They abused the children. They neglected them. They didn't feed them. They never groomed them, the equivalent of giving a monkey a bad childhood. And then later on, these big community cages, they put them in, and they had a choice, water, fruit juice, alcohol. Inevitably, the monkeys who were raised in stressful, abusive environments willingly, happily went after the alcohol, and the ones that had good childhoods did not. So the DNA in your body, the proteins it expresses, aren't automatic. What you're exposed to in your life um, has a lot to do with which proteins get expressed. And in the alcohol abuse preference system, uh, it turns out you can breed in effectively someone who's got a predisposition to be an alcoholic or to, to abuse alcohol. So this book is fantastic. If you like history, um, if you like culture, sociology, science, this book starts at the beginning of civilization. And it, it studies the cultural, sociological effects of alcohol throughout history. It talks about alcohol and warfare, the Romans, how the, how the Romans would invade territories. So the territory were drinking weak beer at the time. The Romans would send in their high alcohol wine for about a month. And they'd turn them all into drunken sots. And then they had no problem overwhelming the populace because they were all uh, a bunch of alcoholics had just been created, and they weren't capable of fighting. But that being said, the Roman soldiers, they got regular um, doses of alcohol. When they went into battle, it made them courageous. It made them brave. And there's a fabulous quotes from ancient Greece and Rome and China, every civilization that has, uh, has developed alcohol. So, so just quick snapshots of this book. The first evidence of humans producing intentionally alcohol um, 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC, um, they find residue of alcohol in pots. Um, and it happens after humans start, they take up agriculture, and they start living in cities, in groups. That's when alcohol production begins. By 1,000 BC, all over the world, where people were living in cities, alcohol was being produced. It was an important commodity. It was being drank in, in large quantities. Now, early on, it wasn't like the alcohol we have today. I mean, it wasn't distilled spirits of high concentration. It was relatively weak beer and wine that uh, doesn't even approach what today's wines are. So Ian Gately attests in this book, most modern humans, people alive today, are descendants of people who lived in cities who were exposed to alcohol as part of their religious systems, as part of their political systems. Uh, he goes into prohibition. Um, I mean, this book is a tour de force if you find alcohol uh, and its effects or its use in our culture interesting. Um, so he sets the stage and then, and then a beautiful book, a fan, one of the best books I've ever read and I highly recommend is uh, the ghost map. 
And in this book, Stephen Johnson really puts together the, the uh, bottleneck that makes alcohol use an evolutionary selection pressure. So this is the story. Um, and so just read the little subtitle, The Story of London's Most Terrifying Epidemic and How It Changed Science, Cities, and the Modern World. This is a profound book. It really tells us about how the modern world is shaped. Everything from public health, sewer systems, to what we understand about the germ theory, um, and science. This is a tour de force in science as well. This is a detective novel. It's the story of a, an anesthesiologist, brilliant man named John Snow, and a clergyman um, named Henry Whitehead, who independently are trying to figure out why is cholera killing people in London. Periodically, these outbreaks happen, and, and hundreds of people die, and then the outbreak goes away, and then it comes back. And at the time, people thought it was bad humors. It was bad air. The germ theory, uh, people didn't have any idea that there would be something in water that could make people sick. So this book is great. Read this book, please. Well, here's the ghost map itself, or one version of the ghost map. And so what you see on this map, so what Henry Whitehead and, and uh, John Snow did is they basically, one of the pieces of evidence is they drew a map of the city. The orange circles are pumps. And there's one called the Broad Street Pump. You'll see right in the middle. Uh, all the black dots are records of somebody died in that house, somebody died in that location. 700 people died in two weeks. And if you drew this map, you see that it radiates. It's very dense around the Broad Street Pump and around the other pumps. Um, it's less and less. And some of the outlying cases, there were cases you know, that people died in houses very near other pumps, but Henry Whitehead interviewed the family and they said, oh, he hated the taste of the water from our pump. He used to walk over to Broad Street um, and drink from that pump. Um, and so they traced, they figured out it was the well, it was the water that where cholera lives and that was causing this outbreak. But here's a cool fact that is kind of a little subscript in the book, but I jumped on because it's so cool. Literally feet from that pump, there's a brewery where there are 70 workers. Not a single one of them died. Not a single one. And on interviewing, well, why is that? None of them walk to the pump because they get free beer with their lunch hour, and they get free beer all day long. And so people who drink alcohol, uh, alcohol was a safe thing to drink in the Middle Ages in these cities, in any city. Alcohol was a safe thing to drink because um, the, the process of producing it, it was sterile. You didn't have cholera. You didn't have dysentery. Um, so just a uh, really, really cool fact in there. So, so this is how Stephen Johnson's um, scenario goes as far as human history, culture, and alcohol. Um, water in cities is inevitably going to get tainted, where large numbers of people come together in the era prior to us understanding sewage and public health and bacteria. Um, epidemics of cholera, dysentery, and other things are going to break out. Those who preferred alcohol to water um, and could handle its toxicity are going to survive more often and have more children. Their genes are going to be passed along. So you can imagine there are three groups of people. If this were an experiment, three groups of people. There's one group that likes alcohol, um, and, uh, but they get really drunk and unruly, and they fall down, and they can't function. There's another group that drinks alcohol, and, they, and they're high functioning. They can drink it, tolerate it, detoxify it, and move on. And then there's a group that, I just don't like the taste of alcohol, they're going to drink water. One of those groups is going to be selected for, the one that can drink alcohol, and uh, can handle their alcohol. There are a couple of cultures on this earth, so um, I don't know if you're aware, um, in the scientific reports, it's very clear, sociological reports, there are a couple of populations of people on the planet who don't do well in the modern world with the alcohol we have access to, uh, Native Americans and Australian Aborigines. Those are hunter-gatherer cultures that never gathered into cities. They never came up with a regular fermentation um, product that they got alcohol from. And so now in the modern world, with alcohol so present, the rates of alcoholism, the rates of all sorts of alcohol-related issues in those groups are sky high, not because of um, many racist theories have come out, you know, weak constitution, and um, you just can't believe the eras of history where things like that, theories like that, were actually given scientific credence. I think this is a very good explanation. They have been through a culture where they were not selected for their ability to handle alcohol. Not only do brain proteins and behavior get selected, but very interesting phenomenon. I won't go too much into alcohol detoxification, but there is an enzyme we have in our body called alcohol dehydrogenase. Ethanol is turned into harmless acetic acid in two steps, and that first enzyme, this is all it seems to do in the body. It starts the process of detoxifying alcohol. It's in your stomach, it's in your liver. There's no reason for that molecule to be there if 
it hadn't been bred into there by many, many generations of exposure to alcohol. It's the reason why people on average can get rid of one drink in an hour. And people who have lots of it can get rid of faster than that, getting rid of alcohol. So some of Irish ancestry or Northern European ancestry might be able to get rid of alcohol faster, much faster than someone who's, uh, let's say, from Korea. In Japan, turns out 50% of the population or so has mutations in the enzyme, the second enzyme, the aldehyde dehydrogenase, so that it doesn't work. And when they drink, their skin turns bright red because the chemical acid aldehyde skyrockets. It's very toxic. And they vomit. A very low dose of alcohol, they become violently ill. So that's an example of a human population where those proteins are expressed differentially. Now, let's come back to the state we love. When you say Wisconsin, you've said a lot about uh, the alcohol culture. This is uh, compiled from Google Maps. Everywhere you see an orange dot, that pixel has more grocery stores than bars. And everywhere there's a red dot, there are more bars than there are grocery stores. And you don't have to be very good at geography to be able to pick out Wisconsin. Uh, the upper Midwest is a, is a highly red place to be. Um, and if you stop and think about what I just told you, these, these profound books about the cultural history of alcohol use, who settled the upper Midwest? It was uh, settlers from large cities in Europe where uh, if you didn't drink alcohol, and if you weren't good at drinking alcohol, you would have died of cholera or dysentery. Um, and so our culture is one that's been selected. And now there's different, it's not just genetic. There are different kinds of culture. There's sociological cultures. There are ideas. Idea, the Wisconsin idea, we hope to pass down good ideas to people. So there's also cultural learning that doesn't have to do with genetics. Um, and that's part of this too. Um, but Wisconsin has a drinking problem. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, we have clean water here. I mean, history has completely turned things. We understand the germ theory. We understand public sanitation. Not everyone has access to good drinking water, but for the most part in America, we do. But we also have access to alcohol, and we have bred into us, I think, this love of drinking it. Uh, and the pro public health problems are enormous. Six billion dollars a year in Wisconsin um, is what it costs to uh, deal with alcohol issues. Alcoholism is a leading cause of domestic violence and other types of violence. Uh, one in 10 deaths are attributed to alcohol use in Wisconsin. And an alcohol-related car crash, every two minutes and in every 30 minutes, somebody dies in the crash. And I think you know it's frequently not the drunk driver. Frequently, it's the sober driver that they hit head on. And I don't know if you know why that is, but a drunk driver, um, their reflexes are slow. The cars, you know, they go into the other lane. And uh, they're so slow, they're basically rubbery when they hit the steering wheel and dashboard. And, and uh, any of you who knows about martial arts, if you relax into a fall, you don't break bones. A sober person with quick reflexes sees the crash. They stiffen their arms. They stiffen their legs. They stiffen their torso. And bones break, and they penetrate organs. And it's just horrifically worse for somebody who reacts and braces for a crash than somebody who relaxes into a crash. So there's another sad fact about drunk driving accidents. Yes? Um, no, thank you for putting that out. No, the third statistic is a na national statistic. First one is Wisconsin specific. The last two are um, national statistics. Thank you. So. I have a habit when I talk to my young audiences. I mean, you, I'm sure if you've ever heard someone speak about public health and alcohol and Wisconsin and the deplorable record we have for how we drink, you'll hear something like, we are number one. Wisconsin is number one when it comes to binge drinking, number one when it comes to uh, um, alcohol use per person. When I say that to a, a group of Wisconsin students, when I say we are number one, they didn't even let me finish. They're like, yeah. Wisconsin is number one. So I don't say that in my talks anymore. I say we are number 50. Wisconsin is the least responsible state when it comes to drinking and driving, when it comes to binge drinking, when it comes to responsible use of alcohol. Um, it's a sad fact, but I think there might be some explanations in, in, the, uh, in the literature, in the, in the evidence we have out there. Not that this makes it OK, understanding it. Uh, I think we are, um, I think it, it's really, um, a goal to overcome our biology. It might be our biology, but I think society, I think the Wisconsin idea is about overcoming our biology by, uh, with learning, and I'm hoping that we can learn better. Please join me in thanking Dr. Strang for this presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much.